This is Debt Free in 30, where every week we talk to industry experts about debt, money, and personal finance. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. My guest on show number 131 was Victoria Rice, co-author with Gail Baz Oxlade of a new book, CEO of Everything, Flying Solo and Soaring that deals with how to cope with becoming suddenly single. On that show, we talked in detail about the emotional aspects of becoming separated, divorced, or widowed, and Victoria had a lot of practical advice for either the person who is now single or for you to help support your suddenly single friends. You can hear that show on iTunes or any podcasting app or on our website at hoys.com. Of course, this show is called Debt Free in 30, and we deal with money. So today we've got the second half of my conversation with Victoria Rice, where we talk exclusively about the financial aspects of becoming suddenly single, where you are now the CEO of everything. If you are the CEO of an actual company, money is one of the main things you're going to be dealing with, if not the main thing. And if you are the CEO of everything in a life, it's it's the same thing. So... Victoria, let's start with maybe some basic things that people wouldn't think about and then get into some more specifics. So in your situation, as you talked about in in our first episode, your husband passed away. Tell me what financial implications there are. I mean, I can think of what the obvious ones are. Okay, well, somebody's income isn't there anymore. But there are things, I guess, that we wouldn't think about. So talk to me in terms of things like disability insurance, life insurance, all those kind of things. What would I not think about in a situation like that that perhaps I should be? In my circumstance, my husband was first on short-term disability, then on long-term disability. So one of the things that happens as you and probably a lot of your listeners know, is when you move from long-term disability, you're getting paid a lot of money relative to your salary. When you move to short-term disability, it goes down. I think in our case, it was it went to 69% of income. So I wasn't working. I was his caregiver. So now we're dealing with less money. I was fortunate because my husband and I both had worked in finance, so we both knew money, that there are some people that's not going to be the case. So partly it can be that rolling scenario of, okay, less money and now even less money, and yet we still have a lot of obligations and things to do. Bills need to be paid, etc. You probably, in our case, we had a car each. So there's even though only one car was being used, still two cars need to have insurance and so on. I guess what I would say to people is that when a death occurs, which was my case that I would speak about, that you think, oh, okay. Now what? So despite all of the shock and what am I going to do without my partner and surprise at what's going on in in your new world, what happens is they don't pay the insurance money right away, but they cut off the disability right away Hmm. because he's no longer short-term disability because he's not alive. So that money stops. So there can be a gap in between the time of when the short-term disability has ended and when you get a payment from... And what kind of gap could that be? Weeks or months? It depends. And it depends because the insurance company, the longer they don't pay you, the more... Money's sitting in their pocket. They're happy. That's it. Exactly, Doug. So consequently, it could be a while. I know in my case, um, in my husband's case, because we had just changed carriers... Um, that they said, well, this was a pre-existing condition. So now my, you know, blessedly lovely insurance agent fought this, but that takes months and they want to know your current doctor and who was the doctor before then. And so now you're trying to gather information and do stuff when you have diminished resources. And, uh, one of the things that was such a wonderful kind of opening for my mind of understanding debt was when I read um, Nassim Taleb's book. He's the fellow who did The Black Swan. Mm-hmm. But I thought his most brilliant book was Anti-Fragile, where he talks about the fact that if you are in debt, you are fragile. And fragility is a difficult situation to find yourself in. What you want to be is, at a minimum, robust. So it's one of the reasons to think about when you are in a partnership, what is in place that you are going to be ready for in case there is a very sudden death. So this gets us into the the practical stuff then. And I want to pick up on just one thing that you said there about the car. 
Mm-hmm. So we both have a car. Mm-hmm. One of us is now disabled and, you know, is going to die. When do you get rid of the car? Like, isn't that, it's not a financial question. It's an emotional question. Because as soon as I sell my, my husband's car, we know he's never coming back, even though he's, he's still alive. I mean, it would make sense not to be paying the insurance for a car we're not driving. Um, I, I would imagine that's a pretty emotionally charged decision as opposed to a financial decision. You're absolutely correct. And it's low on the list of things to do. Yeah. You know, some days you're just getting up and saying, oh, have I washed my face today or did I eat today? Or have I, you know, when was the last time I changed my underwear? Like You're just not in, in this world. You are in a very discombobulated state. Um, and so money is not tending to be priority. And, you know, but at the same time, the utilities companies, the insurance companies, people who are giving you gas or electricity or whatever it may be, telephone, you know, they're very sorry for you, but they're still sending you a bill. Yeah. And it still has to be paid. Yeah. Cause that's the way it is. Well, and, and I'll read a quote from the book here. In many relationships, one person manages the money while the other is happy simply being kept in the loop or ignoring the money completely. So that's a a quote from your book, CEO of Everything. So what's your general advice then for someone who is now the chief financial officer in in addition to being the CEO of everything? And and maybe you could split it into two parts um, as a planning point then. So let's assume that my spouse is still here. Everything's still going great, but things change in the future. What should I be thinking about now, particularly if I'm the person who doesn't handle the money? Where do I start? If you're in a partnership, there's a 99% chance one of you is going to go Mm -hmm. first, right? Yeah, unless the plane crashes at the same time. Exactly the case. Exactly the case, Doug. So one of you is going to go first. How is the other one being taken care of? How do you help them continue on? So it's a very selfless act to do planning this way. Buying insurance, making sure it's in order, having a will. As you and I know, so many people don't have a will. Well, that, you know, uh, on top of somebody being in grief, you now want to have them have to go through the court process for all of the elements that might come up. What if they have, you know, a blended family and there's other people there and there's a lot to be done. And if it was something where there was life insurance and you did get a big payout in the sense of big being whatever it might be, maybe it was 250000 maybe it was more. Well, suddenly do you have people who know that you got life insurance and now you're dealing with people wanting to ask you for money? And that's why one of the things we say is first, do nothing. Because if you are in that position where you've just received this money, you might think, oh, wow, that's like more money than I ever thought was possible. But that's going to go pretty quickly. It is surprising. And if you don't know where the money goes, and as I said, I was fortunate. We both handled the money. Um, so I knew where all the money was going while my husband was sick. And I knew what was coming up. And so I could have some kind of preparation. But for someone who that wasn't it, and and be assured, when you're when you're dealing with a crisis like this or someone is terminally ill, Money is not the really the first thing on your mind, but it's part of one of those things of being an adult where you get things in place so you don't have to think about it. You mentioned a will, and in your book you say, uh, don't use a generic will kit to make a, a will. So what are you talking about and why? It's not that expensive really to get a will. And what you get is valuable advice from a lawyer. A real lawyer. A real lawyer who handles wills, who understands estates, and is going to ask you questions that will help you. It's a small price to pay to have things in order to make your life easier. Because once you become CEO of everything and you're on your own, you want to know that there's some backup for you, that there is an infrastructure you've put in place, and one of them is a will that's been properly set out. It's it's that whole idea of, you know, Courtroom drama, isn't that exciting? When you watch it on TV, the families are fighting because one person got the money. It's the first wife, it's the second wife, it's the first husband, it's the second husband. But at the same time, you're thinking, if you're really, really sad, if you're mourning the loss of your beloved, is that what you want to be dealing with? 
Yeah, a big fight. And, and I guess it depends on your situation. If, you know, if we have no assets, if we rent an apartment and, you know, don't have a car and don't have any money, then okay, I guess a will is, is less important because there's nothing to split up. But you've kind of painted the picture of where it would be critically important if, like you say, it's a blended family. I've got, you know, kids from my first marriage, kids from my second marriage, an ex-wife, a current wife, or this or that. I've got a cottage, a, a, cottage, a business, a house, whatever. Um, if you die without a will. Just Google that and get scared. Yeah, it's it's just a mess because there is no obvious process for distributing your assets other than going to court and fighting about it. And isn't that a pleasant way to spend your time? Yeah, I've, I've just gone through a death and now we get to get to go through court. So if you have any assets at all or expect to have any assets and it's not just the the financial will obviously there's the the concept of a um i guess generically what's called a living will but a you know a, a power of attorney a healthcare thing if i'm if i'm disabled and unable to make decisions but i'm not dead who's going to make the medical decisions for me so these are all things you should think about in advance and pay the money and get it done right is what you're saying Absolutely, because it'll be the best investment you ever make because what happens is when one of you goes, you have helped the other person get on with their life because, as I say, their life is still going to continue. And have you made it an easy road? Is it a bed of roses to keep going or is it a rocky road where it's going to take them so much time? And and if anyone has dealt with the estate for anyone... It is a lot of work. Even for someone who's very organized, it's a lot of work. You need a lot of death certificates. You have to send them to every party who's involved. Yeah, and so the more planning you can do, the better. So, And you go into this in, in detail in your book, so I encourage everyone to, to get a copy and, and see what's there. But why don't you give me sort of two or three practical pieces of advice then? So let's say that I'm currently married, and let's say that my spouse is the one who handles all the money. I don't, I don't pay the bills. That's, that's not my thing. I do something else. That's, that's not it. And like you, you alluded to, and it's certainly been in my experience, in pretty much every relationship, person A does one thing and person B does the other. That's just the, the way it works. So if you're the person, if I'm the person who doesn't handle the money, what are some things that I should at least be aware of now? What, 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 what do I not know? This question always fascinates me. Someone says, oh, I don't know anything about the money. Really? Okay, you work hard for it. You talk about it a lot. You want to have things in your life, but you don't know about the money. You know more about going to Costa Rica than you do about what's in your banking account or your investment account or uh, TFSA. What, what have you got? I'm just fascinated that people have this disconnect between realizing that money gives you options and that because you have money and you have options, you can make choices. If you want to find yourself without choices and without any knowledge and at the bottom of a very, very steep learning curve, don't pay any attention to money. If you think it's always going to come in and it'll all be fine, okay, that's your dream world. But it's a huge part of your life and why people have you know, can tell you every episode that ever went on on Friends or Seinfeld or Six Feet Under or whatever, but they don't know some of the basics about what is driving their life. So what are the things I need to know then? Like the, the basic things. So think about it from this point of view. Do you love your future self? You love your today self. You're doing all sorts of things for your today self. You know, here I got this or I bought this or I did this. But what about your future self? Do you love your future self? It's one reason why I've talked about this. When you are borrowing, you are taking from your future self. Now, Gail actually calls it stealing. But when you are borrowing money, you are borrowing income from your future self. And if you don't love your future self, then you get yourself into debt. Not a good scenario. Love your future self. So consequently, how much money is it that you are spending right now? There's lots of people who don't know how much they spend each year. Do they have any idea? And even if you just do it for a month, just write down every penny you spend. It, honestly, I'm so old school. I do it every month and I just use one of those you know, pieces of uh, paper. It's just three rings in it. It's in a binder and I just put it in. This is how much I spent on food. This is how much I spent on car and gifts and utilities and travel and taxes and so on. 
just to give yourself an idea, because if you have no idea ever where the money goes, how will you know if you have enough? So very, very basic things. And obviously, Gail is is famous for her jar method, mm -hmm. um, which is more of a proactive budgeting method as opposed to a, a retroactive where did the money go. But it's really the same thing. Okay, well, if I put you know, X number of dollars in the jar and at the end of the month I've run out of the money, then I guess I didn't, I, I didn't know where it was going. So, so number one thing, if you're clueless about money, if your partner is the one who does all the, the finances is where does the money go? What does it cost to live? And what are the other traps I can fall into then when my partner dies? I mean, I guess there's some basic stuff like how do I access the bank account? I mean, where, everything's online, right? Where are the passwords? Where are the passwords? And so I should know where the passwords are. Absolutely. Um, Where's the insurance policy? Is there an insurance policy? Where is the booklet that they give you that everybody gets on day one of starting if they work for a company? Where's the booklet? And what does it mean? And what what's coming? And what isn't coming? So would it be a good idea... And I, it, again, it makes sense that one partner pays all the bills because having two people writing checks, I guess people don't actually write checks anymore. But if we actually were still in an era where we wrote checks, having two people writing checks doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But would it make sense one month of the year for person B to pay all the bills? That could be one option. I know a couple and what they do is every Sunday they sit down for an hour. And they go over, where did the money go this week? What are we planning for? What do we want for our future? And so they're being proactive about it. I, I am always astounded, Doug, when people say, well, oh, I'm just an airhead about money. And it can be men or women. It's like, really? Here's this thing that you talk about a lot. You want a lot. You buy things. You spend it. But you have, actually haven't thought about it. You haven't planned out. Like one of the things in, in part of the planning that I I, I remember being so lucky to read this book um, by Daryl Diamond talking about your RRSP blueprint, where he said, what is it you want there? How much money are you going to need? What are you going to put in? And people say, well, I'll just take CPP and OAS. And all these people thinking they're going to get maximum of CPP. It's not the case. I, I even had a conversation last night with a friend and we were talking about CPP and she has worked her whole life Okay, she is just about to turn 65. She has worked since she graduated from university. So full time, that entire time. She says she even gets $8 short of the maximum. Hmm. And so here's someone who's worked their whole life and they're not even going to get the maximum. So why people keep thinking they're going to get maximum CPP, it's not the case. Most people get, the, I think the average is about two thirds. Yeah, because if there was any period of time when you were out of the workforce or were not earning the maximum dollars, so if you took time off to have kids or if you were unemployed for a period of time or if you were self-employed for a period of time and weren't making the contributions that were required, you're not going to get the, the full the full whack. So Yeah, if you're getting the average CPP that people are getting, you're getting $666 a month. What exactly is that going to cover for you? Wow, which is probably less than what you're earning now substantially less. And, and maybe you saw recently, there was some documentation that said that Canadians who are, I think it was 55 to 64, only 18% of them. So 18 people out of 100 have enough money to last five years. Hmm. So what are those other 82 people going to do? Yeah. Yeah. They're, I sure hope CPP and OAS covers it. You know, like you say, the six or 700 bucks I get, I hope that's uh, enough to live off of. So from a practical point of view, then, if, if I'm the, the airhead that you've described, um, and you said it in a nice way when you called me an airhead, um, <laughs> it's the first question I should ask is, what do I want? What do we want? Mm -hmm. What's, what's the plan here? And if the plan is I would like to retire at 65 and have enough money to pay the rent, then relying on CPP of $600 a month maybe isn't going to do it. So that's, I guess, the starting point. And then number two, knowing how much you're spending. That's kind of a basic thing as well. And I agree with you. I'm I'm not a big fan of budgeting because most people just get diverted from it and don't do it. But I do agree with the strategy of, so for one week or one month, write everything down. And if you if you can't write everything down, pay for everything on your debit card. Then at least it'll all be on your bank statement. You can download it from the internet. You can see it all there. And that gives you at least a picture of where it's all going. And knowing where it goes allows you to then make changes. Exactly. Because CFOs have to manage the money. 
you are now the chief financial officer. So what is it that you are going to do? You have this amount of money. It, it's going to be allocated somewhere. How are you going to allocate it? What is part for your future? What is part for today? Do you find yourself, and this is uh, something that is amazing to me, is when people find themselves single, sometimes they realize, wait a minute, I can't afford to stay living where I am. Mm -hmm. I can't afford to keep going on these vacations. I can't afford to put a trip on my credit card because, as I'm sure you see people in your scenario, you cannot keep on with the same life you are having in most cases. You're going to have to make some alterations. And so do you want to be prepared for them and at least know where the money is going so that you can then say, how do I cut? How do I add? It, it's back to that wonderful you know, numerator and denominator thinking, those fractions. The numerator, the number on the top is how much you're bringing in. Denominator on the bottom, how much is going out. So you can change either of those and suddenly find yourself, geez, am I numerator thinking I got to earn more money or am I denominator thinking I got to cut more so I'm not spending as much? And that kind of thinking, again, gets your brain working and saying, okay, really, this is my life and I earned this money. Now, how am I going to spend it? Well, and ultimately you hit the key word, which is thinking. That's the answer. That's the answer to everything we've talked about, that you have to do thinking in order to, you know, where do I want to get to? Do the math. Can I get there? And if I can't, then then now's the time to make changes. So I want to ask you a couple of sort of quick hit questions just as we close here, because I think that's some fantastic advice. And again, the the book CEO of Everything has all this in, in a lot more detail. So um, I want you to tell me about why you think it's important to declutter. And, and specifically, you've got a, a quote in the book, uh, would I be willing to physically carry it? So tell me what you're talking about there. When I was looking around my house, I thought, I have a lot of stuff. How did I end up with all this stuff? I bought it or someone gave it to me. And is it now part of my today life? So I started using that picture in my mind of, okay, I have to actually physically carry this around in my life. And that's what part of being CEO of everything is, is you're responsible for everything. So I looked at that and it helped me, Doug, to say, you know what? This is not being helpful. I would not carry that to my new home if I was moving somewhere. And the decluttering part of it is, and there's so many studies that are out now on this, is that you actually have more time in your life if you have a more organized life. You actually are a person who you can put your hand on something as opposed to going, you know, and, and part of it becomes self-talk. Oh, I can never find anything. Or where is everything? And that difficulty of, you know, when you're, especially if you are newly widowed or find yourself newly single, you're, you're having sort of a low bit of self-esteem in all probability. And so you don't want to be self-talking and saying, oh, I can never find anything or, oh, this is really hard. Instead, you want to be saying to yourself, no, I know where things are. I know how it is. And a big piece for me was I just wanted to stop cleaning. I wanted to spend less of my life <laughs> cleaning. Everything you own, you have to store it. You have to clean it. You have to have it somewhere. You have to wear it. You have to think about it. You have to look at it. You have to move it around if you want to do something else. And I just thought I wanted to say instead, actually, I want to do more living. Yep. And the less stuff you've got, the easier the, the easier it is to do that. Um, let's talk about debt. And you already... Uh, uh, touched on it with your uh, anti-fragile, I think was was what you had said. So clearly you're of the mind that the less debt you've got, the better, because that's the ultimate protection, obviously. I mean, if you don't have money in the bank, that's a problem. But if you've got massive debt when your partner departs, then you've you've really got a problem. It's as simple as that, right? It's a it is a problem, and I feel for people on this one. I, I'm I, Gail and I were talking about this one day because we were saying that right now the average Canadian for every dollar of income has a dollar and sixty eight cents of, of mm -hmm. debt. So you've got a dollar of income and a dollar sixty eight in debt. That's a lot of debt. And I said, Gail, you don't have any debt, and I don't have any. So someone else has our debt as well. So there's other people with more than a dollar sixty eight. But that makes you so precarious. What happens? If you've got a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, and they call it, mm -hmm. people don't realize it's a callable yep. loan. And where are you going to get the money? You're not. What are you going to have as an option? Nothing except trying to find the money from somebody else or selling your home. What if you're like a whole bunch of people who they're doing that to? 
Well, we live economically, supply and demand. If there's more supply, less demand, prices will change. And what we were very interested in in highlighting to people is the stock market, which is where I spend a lot of my life, and also the housing market. They are both up and down, up and down. So consequently, if you say, oh, well, my house has only gone up since I've got it, <laughs> that can change. Yeah. And it can change quickly. And same with the stock market. These are two variable resources. They are not fixed. And so what we wanted to say was, if you have debt, you have fewer options. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And you're over 30 years old. That's how you know that real estate goes up and down and the stock market goes up and down. And I mean, we're recording this in, in early 2017 here in our Toronto office where the real estate market has been great for years and years and years. If we were sitting in Fort McMurray today, or even in Vancouver, where things have leveled off, it would be a totally different story. But when you have that perception that it always goes up, um, and, and of course, the stock market, you don't have to be that old to remember when things have gone down, because it has corrections all year long. But you're right, over the, the long term, certainly over the last few years, it's it's been strong. So understanding that things can change is one of the impetuses for having as little debt as possible then. And that's what gives you the flexibility to do what you want. I guess if you have a house with a big mortgage and your partner dies or you get separated and you have to move, that's a lot more difficult than if you have a house with no mortgage. It is. And I think if people spent a bit more time realizing that debt makes you weaker, they would be less inclined to take on more debt. Because a lot of consumer debt, I, I have a friend who works at one of the big banks and she just talked to me recently and she said, I'm dealing with a really difficult consumer proposal right now. And this fellow, he um, uh, he has $168,000 of consumer debt. It's like, what? Like, how do you run up $168,000 of consumer debt? So they've massive amounts. Like, how did you get to that point? How did you think? When did you ever stop and say, oh, 50 is too much? Oh, 75 is too much. Okay, 100. That's it. I'm done. No, you just keep going and going and going. And so there's a mentality there. I don't know what it is about just keeping taking on more debt and that that'll be okay. And at some point when there's too many people who have done this, as you've seen, yep. collapse. Yeah. Well, and and the flip side of the question is, what was the bank thinking when they loaned that person $168,000? Absolutely. So it's a, it's a two-way street. We... We aren't thinking to the future, but obviously the banks aren't either. They're looking at, well, the loan is performing today. The money's still coming in. So let's, let's raise the credit limit. And I guess it comes back to the same point you made earlier with respect to budgeting. You've got to look to the future. So in the future, will I be able to pay this back? So one final question related to debt and mortgages and real estate. Um, and you can tell me if I'm misquoting this here, but I believe you had a section in the book where you do not necessarily recommend that a newly single person use life insurance proceeds or a divorce settlement to immediately pay off a mortgage. Am I saying that correctly? And, and if so, why? It's back to the statement that I made earlier. First, do nothing. You are not in your complete right mind as all of this change is going on. You've got just too much information. What you need is to have a settling in order to see, okay, what is it that I want? Because if you use that money and paid off the mortgage, but now you don't have anything to live on, what are you going to do? Oh, then you're going to put on a home equity line of credit. Oh, okay, well, is that a good idea or not? Because you think, oh, well, it's there, I can use it. Instead, if you thought about it and thought more deeply about, okay, let me just keep running this ship right now along this path and see what happens. And then I can make decisions when I'm a bit more certain about what I want my life to look like. At the beginning, you don't know what your life is going to look like because all you know is right now you're in a fog. And until that clears, too difficult to make a big decision. That's a big financial decision. Too right. difficult to make that big financial decision, which is why we also say that if people know you've got a settlement and they come saying, oh, well, can you just loan me some money because I've got this debt or I want to do this thing? Don't do that either. First, do nothing. 
Yeah, get get your feet on the ground first. So you're not saying it's a bad idea to pay off a mortgage. You're saying it's a good idea to make sure you've considered all the options. That's right. If you have a, a mortgage that's at a low rate and matures in six months anyways, well, fine, pay it off in six months. Then why be paying the penalty to pay it off? If you're not planning to move, then it's less of an issue. On the other hand, if you are planning to move really quickly, okay, well, then maybe it does make sense to, to deal with it. Or maybe, again, it doesn't matter. I'm selling the house anyways. I've got this cash. I can use that to be buying the new place. So it's it really is thinking it all through is, is what it comes down to. So, well, that's great. I've got 57 more questions, but we are out of time. So people are going to have to read the book and, and, and get the rest of it. What final advice would you have for people then? specifically in the in the financial realm if they are either um going through sudden singleness now or if they want to plan for it in the future what what should i be thinking in my brain right now this is really important and this is what people need to say to themselves that they are their most important asset so everyone say this to yourself i am my most important asset because people will often say, oh, well, I've got a stock portfolio or I've got a house and it's my biggest asset. Wrong. Their biggest asset is themselves. You are your capacity to have the amazing life that you want to create. You have the capacity to earn money. You have the capacity to make decisions. You have the capacity to bring joy and creativity into this world. So keep remembering that you are your most important asset and treat that asset with good care. That's the key. I think that's a fantastic way to end it. And and you're putting the power in your own hands. Obviously, life has dealt you some blows that you had hoped wouldn't happen, but it's happened. Nothing you can do about it now. Focus on the future is really what you're saying. You are still alive and you have a lot to give. And a lot of people who will be so appreciative of you being in their lives. So in those terms... Be a giver and be a person who is saying, I am CEO of everything, and it's a great job. Fantastic. Well, that's a, a great way to end it. The book is CEO of Everything, Flying Solo and Soaring by Gail Vaz Oxlade and Victoria Rice, who was my guest today. Victoria, thanks for being here. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Victoria. Once again, the book is CEO of Everything, Flying Solo and Soaring, that deals with how to cope with becoming suddenly single. This was part two of my conversation with Victoria Rice, who co-authored the book with Gail Vaz Oxlade. On part one, which aired two weeks ago, show number 131, we talked about the emotional aspects of being suddenly single, and today we focused on the financial aspects. Victoria shared a lot of practical advice, and I agree with what she had to say about debt. When you have cash in the bank, you have options. But when you're borrowing, you are, as she puts it, stealing from your future self. So the most basic protection against financial problems caused by becoming suddenly single is to get out of debt. That's our show for today. Full show notes are available at hoys.com. That's H-O-Y-E-S dot com, including a link to how you can get a copy of Victoria's book, which is also available now at bookstores everywhere. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoys. That was Debt Free in 30.